Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you would, and look with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter. Luke chapter uh, number 19, if you will. Uh, one of the more familiar passages in all of the Bible. Now, when I was a little boy, uh, we used to have a game that we would play called <clears throat> Hide and Seek. Y'all ever play that game? Uh, I, I was pretty good at it. My cousins were a lot better than I was. I, I just remembered uh, yesterday as I was coming up the road, uh, one of my favorite places to hide. I was just a little fella, just a little fella. I would uh, hide in the dirty clothes hamper. I'd get down in there and then I'd cover myself up with those dirty clothes. And they'd, they'd have a hard time finding me in there. Uh, I think sometimes they just wanted me to stay in there to get out of the way so they never did find me. I don't know, but... Uh, the other day at, at my mom's assisted living, they played hide and seek in the assisted living with all, I, I, with all of the residents that were in there. And uh, my mom hid, and she was the one that everybody had to go find. Uh, if anybody sees my mama, would you please uh, help me just a little bit? But it was fun that that game is still going on, uh, and they played it for a long time down there the other day at, at hide, hide and seek. But you know, th th there is such a thing as uh, spiritual hide and seek. Uh, a lot of people want to put distance between themselves and uh, with God, and they feel like, well, I can try to hide from God. And there may be some of you that are here this morning that you've been playing that spiritual hide and seek game for so long, you're no longer hidden, uh, you're lost. Now this morning I want to talk to you about a man named Zacchaeus. You all all remember that little rhyme we used to have, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. You all all remember uh, that little nursery rhyme I guess it was. But we're going to talk about him. So take your Bible. Look with me at chapter 19 beginning in verse number 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, uh, which was the chief, chief, chief. He was the head of all of the publicans or the tax collectors. And he was rich. He sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. He made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying uh, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham or a son of faith. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now you can picture in your mind Jesus going through Jericho, passing by that way. Jericho was a happening place. I mean, they had it going on. It, it, it was really kind of a hub of a major trade center that fed the city of Jerusalem. So there was a lot of stuff going on there. It was under Roman rule, and as a result of being under the Roman domination, they were heavily, heavily, heavily taxed. So they had Roman tax collectors, and then they had Jewish tax collectors. Now the Jews hated the Roman tax collectors, but let me tell you what, 
the Jewish tax collectors were in a whole different world of, them, of themselves uh, in the eyes of their uh, fellow Jews. They were hated, they were despised, they were rejected. Now, the chief among those tax collectors, the Bible says the head of all of them, was an old boy by the name of Zacchaeus. He was very, very wealthy. Uh, he had gained his wealth uh, as a result of till tapping. When he would go out and uh, collect the taxes from the people, he would uh, keep some for himself. And he became very wealthy as a result of that. In all probability, as it was in most cases, his own family would disown him. They wouldn't have anything to do with him. He was a Jew, but he was not allowed into the temple because the priests, if they were caught with a tax collector, it would be considered an abomination. Jesus was passing through that area, and guess what? Jesus wanted to be with that tax collector. He wanted to connect with the tax collector. Uh, he wanted to meet him. He wanted to be with him. Because Zacchaeus was not hidden anymore. Zacchaeus was lost. How many of you have ever uh, really gotten lost in your life? How many of you? I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my parents and a bunch of us, it was a lot of my family, uh, went up to a place called Bat Cave. I don't know if you've ever been to Bat Cave or not, but that was long before it was ever commercialized like it is today. And uh, my cousin and I wandered off, and we got up into the woods, and we lost our way. And it was getting toward dark, and we didn't know where we were. We didn't know how to get back. And you know, I still remember the feeling of being lost. Do you, do you have, can, can you identify with that feeling? If you've ever been lost, you ought to be able to, to remember what that felt like. Do you remember what it felt like when you got lost and couldn't find your way back? There are a lot of people that feel lost in our world today. If I could ask you this morning, give me a one-word description of what it feels like to be lost, what kind of word would you give me? Terrified, somebody said. Scared, someone said. Fear, somebody said. Anxious, despair, maybe panic, disconnected, alienated, confused. Uh, now, this morning, in all probability, there's somewhere near 500 people that are sitting here at the 8 o'clock service. And you can be right in the middle of 500 people. There'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 here this morning. Um, and right in the middle of those, there will be many people that have that distinct feeling of being lost. Now, a lot of people don't like that feeling. Uh, they don't enjoy that feeling. And they'll do everything and anything that they can to really not have it. And they will compensate for it. And one of the ways that they compensate for that feeling is that they get busy and they find themselves trying to fill up every waking moment that they can with busyness, doing something so that they don't have to look down deep inside their own life and experience that feeling of lostness. Another way is that uh, people wind up compensating for that feeling is that they distance themselves from people. They don't want to really uh, have a close affinity with people. They don't want to have a close relationship. And so they hold everybody off at arm's length. And they'll pass one another by and they'll say, how you feeling? How are you today? And they'll just keep on walking. I, I, I want to tell them when they do me that way, well, just stand still for a minute and, and I'll tell you about my vertigo. I, I'll be glad to just stop right there. I, I want to chase ass for them every once in a while and say, wait a minute, I got stuff to tell you. If you ask me the question, let me tell you how I feel. Uh, but we hide. We mask over what we really have deep inside and we've hidden it. And, and we become really... If we want to get 
real gut level honest about this thing, we, uh, we, we, we just get to the point that we become fakes. That's what it means to hide. But Jesus says, I have come to bring you life. I, I have come to seek and to save that, uh, what you are experiencing called lostness. I shared with you last week or a week before, sometime in the last couple of weeks that in Colossians uh, chapter one and verse 15 that Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. And so we look at Jesus and we can get a, get a glimpse of who God is. So I want us to dig into this story for just a minute and I want us to find out a little bit more about God than maybe we would have ever known uh, otherwise. Now, first of all, one of the things that I see in this story is this. You ready? God knows exactly where you are. Here comes Jesus through Jericho. He gets uh, to this certain sycamore tree and he just stops and he looks up. <laughs> he looked up because he knew where Zacchaeus was. Uh, he, he was purposefully going through that town uh, and to discover old Zacchaeus. Do you ever feel like, and be honest with yourself for just a minute, do you ever feel like sometimes that God is so far away from you, that God is so distanced from you, that God is so remote from you that you don't believe that God knows anything uh, about your life? Well, I got news for you. You're in for a huge surprise because God knows exactly your situation. He's sensitive to all of the hurts and he's sensitive to all of your needs and you're not out of his sight. You may be running this morning, but I want to tell you, friend, you can't outrun God. He knows exactly where you are and where you're going to be. The good news is today, God knows where you are. The second thing that I see from this story is God knows who you are. Not only does God know where you are, God knows who you are. He stops at the base of that sycamore tree. He looks up into the tree and he doesn't say, hey, wee you little man? Uh, hey, shorty, come, come down here. No, no, no. He looks up in there and he says, Zacchaeus. Boy, don't you think for a minute that old Zacchaeus was caught completely off guard? Don't you think that he was simply amazed here he just wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus was passing by. He wants to see Jesus and Jesus stops at the tree and he says, Zacchaeus. He called him uh, by his name. I, I got tickets the other night to the Hornets game. and Not just any old ticket. I, I got second row right behind the player's bench. I, I'm telling you, some, some church members gave me that. By the way, uh, there are, are no other staff members that are interested at all in tickets to, to any of the sporting events. I, I'm really the only one that cares anything about that stuff. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm sitting there and I couldn't believe my eyes. Here comes Michael Jordan up and he's going to sit right near me. And, and so he, he, I, I, I thought, there's Michael Jordan. There he is. And he stopped right in front of me. Down there on the floor, he stopped right in front. And he looked dead into my eyes and his eyes got big and he pointed his finger right at me. And he said, Mike Whitson, First Baptist Church, Indian Trail. <laughs> now that never happened. <laughs> Just say, none of it. But I hope you caught just a little glimpse of maybe what it was like for Ozacchaeus up there in that tree when Jesus called him by his name. Not only does he know where you are, he knows who uh, you are. You, you, you have to understand, he was a hated man. And, and I promise you, he had been called a lot of names by a lot of people and they weren't very kind and they weren't very gracious at all. And, and, and the thing about it is, you know, Zacchaeus means pure one. 
And don't you think that his culture had a huge time playing off that name? Don't, don't you think for, it's kind of like Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein means peacemaker. Eh, none of that was true. And, and they had a big time. But here comes Jesus, looks up, and he honors him unbelievably by calling his name. Let me say, God knows where you are. God knows who you are. And he is interested in you personally. You are his divine creation. Uh, you are uh, a major, he made a major investment in you. So he knows where you are, he knows who you are. And third, God wants to be a part of your life. One of the things that I recognize out of this passage incredibly is that Jesus took the initiative with Zacchaeus and he invited himself to dinner. How many of you ever do that? You ever invite yourself to somebody's house? If I were to come over to you and I say, hey, Richard, you know, after church today, I'm going to dinner with you. Well, dinner, that, that would stagger Richard unbelievably. He'd go to stuttering and stammering and he'd try to figure out, well, how am I going to respond to that? And if I'm not careful, Richard's going to be making this, my pastor's gone crazy. But, but that's exactly what Jesus did. You, you ever wonder why he did that? I want to tell you why. Because he knew that Zacchaeus was ready. He knew that Zacchaeus was hungry for something that he had never experienced before other than what he was experiencing in his own life. He was tired of it and he wanted something different and he knew that deep down in Zacchaeus' heart that Zacchaeus believed that he would never be good enough for Jesus. I've met a lot of people that felt the same way. I met a lot of people that felt like I could never be good enough for Jesus. But, but understand that God not only took the initiative with Zacchaeus, he took the initiative with all of us. The Bible says that Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, that God had already predetermined how that he was gonna redeem us out of our sin because he wanted us to know him. He wanted us to have a relationship with him. So he put his plan in motion. He took the initiative and Jesus came and lived a sinless life and he died on that old rugged cross and he shed his rich, red, royal, innocent blood so that you and I could be forgiven of our sin. God took the initiative in that. The truth is we're not good enough. We have to depend on God. One of the greatest privileges that you and I can ever experience in this life is that the God of this universe, the God who established this playground that we call Earth wants a relationship with me. He wants a relationship with you. Not just a religious experience. I'm afraid that our churches are packed full of people who've had nothing more than just a religious experience when they walk down an aisle of a church and they sign some card and they join some uh, Role of a Baptist church somewhere or they went through the waters of baptism. They've had a religious experience but they've never had a relationship with Jesus. Picked up my grandson Monday at the airport and uh, we got in the car and uh, you know the weather was absolutely horrendous uh, Monday and um, we were making our way out of the airport and uh, over on the 485 and I said, son, there's a, a lot of people want to have lunch with us today. And uh, I said, it's not just us. Uh, they want to see you. They want to they hang out with you. They want to have some lunch with you today. What do you think about that? He looked back over at me and he said, Pop, uh, I just want to be with you. God says, the same thing. I just want to be near you. I just want to have a relationship with you. But a lot of people, they wake up on Sunday morning and the alarm clock goes off and it's Sunday morning and they, 
take God and they put him on their lap and they ride to church and they enjoy about a 90 minute time and they go back to their car, put God back on their lap and they drive back to their house and they put him back in the bed until next week when they go through the same motions all over again. God wants so much more with us than that. God wants to be intimately involved with us uh, in our life. Do, do you know what? Here's one of the things that really I, I wanted to just kind of hammer home this morning. The ones that most people have given up on already, God's really just getting started with. You may have even given up on yourself, but I got good news for you this morning. <laughs> You're a big fan with Jesus. I'm, I'm grateful that when Jesus looks at all of us, he doesn't see winners and losers. I'll tell you what he does see. He sees the saved and he sees the lost. And he is uh, a relentless pursuer of those that are lost. Now then, how can we be found? What can we learn from the rest of this passage this morning, from this Ian encounter that Jesus had with Zacchaeus? All right, here we go. How can we be found? Number one, admit that you're lost. On the surface, it really looks like that Zacchaeus had it all together. Well-dressed, well-manicured, plenty of money, great house. Uh, it looked like surfacely, he had it all together. Very wealthy, had a secure government job, had it all. But what Zacchaeus found out and what so many need to find out is money is not going to satisfy that deep need in your heart. Zacchaeus got to the place that he didn't like the fact that nobody cared for him. He got sick and tired of his day-to-day -day ripping people off. He, he, he got tired of the fact that his conscience was bothering him and he came to the place that I, I, I got to have something different. I want something more. There's got to be more to life than what I am experiencing. And, and let me just say to you, when you get to that point in your life, it is then that you can start climbing upward. When you get dissatisfied so much with the present, then you get eager for the future. Uh, number two, not only admit that you're lost, do whatever you can to get to Jesus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. He was physically handicapped. He couldn't look over the heads of people to see Jesus as he was walking down the road. And so he said, I've got to do something about this. I can't, they won't let me through. I can't see over them. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go climb that tree up there and I know that that's the route that he's on and so I can look down and I can see him from that vantage point. So, so what are you saying? I, I'm, I'm saying that you need to do whatever you have to do to get to Jesus. So put down that pride that you've been holding on to for so long and get over the feelings of the crowd and climb up over them and look down and see Jesus and you're gonna see something pretty amazing when you cast your eyes on him. Now, I tell people all of the time, whenever I get the opportunity, but just investigate the truth. Now, when you're investigating the truth about Jesus, you may find out that he is a liar and that everything that he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and can't comes to the Father but by me. When, when you hear things that there's no other way to God but me, and you realize that he says, now, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and you investigate the truth, when you get through all of that, you may discover that he's a liar. When you're investigating the truth, you may find that he's a lunatic, that he had some kind of major mental illness that um, 
presumed that he was the Messiah. There were all kinds of men cropping up all over the world at that time claiming that they were the Messiah. Maybe you'll find that he was a lunatic, uh, that he had delusions of being that Messiah. But if you really investigate, you won't find that he was a liar. You won't find that he was nuts and a lunatic. You're going to find that he's Lord. And if that's true, and your eternity is based on that truth, you better do everything that you possibly can to get to Jesus. The third thing that I would encourage you to do is not only admit that you're lost, do everything that you can to get to Jesus, you need to respond to his call. Zacchaeus, come down. Make haste. Come down right now. And if you study verse 5 and 6, you find out that... <laughs> Oh, Zacchaeus hopped down out of that tree as quickly as he could to get to Jesus, immediately, promptly. By the way, when you study the call of God on people's lives, that's what you're going to find all throughout. It's very consistent in the scripture. When God is calling you, when he's out reaching out to you, when he is seeking you and you become aware of it, you're going to discover that the immediate response ought to be, i got to get to him as quickly as I can. What is that call? Well, maybe you look around and you see that the world is falling apart. You, you already know that politics doesn't have the answer. You already know politicians don't have the solutions. You look around and see your world falling apart, it's a good time and a good sign that God's maybe showing you that he's the only way. Maybe it's through your own pain and your helplessness and you may be in the midst of a crisis in your life. God could be using that to get you to him. The bottom line to a call is you get to a point in your life when you feel lost, when you feel helpless and you're confused and you're overwhelmed and you're hiding. And the bottom line is that you just don't feel like you're at home in this life and you're a stranger. I, I, I love the way this is written. I, I can almost see Zacchaeus' face and he's, he's enamored with the fact that Jesus wants to spend some time with him and he hops down out of that tree and he says hey Jesus uh, man I got some great sandwiches we got stuff to make sandwiches at my house now I don't have any ham and I don't have any bacon but I got some fish over there and we'll make us a fish sandwich you can just see the excitement in his face and he welcomed him into his house he welcomed him into his home he welcomed him into his life More good news. You can take Jesus home with you today. Aren't you tired of religion? God wants a relationship with you. Here's the thing that jumped out at me because I could relate to it so much because it it was just part of my thinking as I was growing up. Jesus didn't look at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, go home, get your house cleaned up because you're not ready for me to come yet. So get, go, go, go get your house cleaned up. Go get it straightened up. Get rid of that stuff out of your house. And when you get rid of that stuff out of your house and get it ready for me, then I'll come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're waiting today to get it all together before you receive Jesus into your home and into your life, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. Jesus said, invite me over, invite me in, and I'll help you clean it up. 
never too late to invite Jesus in your heart. Now, two things that are happening. We, we don't know what exactly happened in that relationship in their home. We're not told what the conversations were like, but I'm going to tell you, something happened because after Zacchaeus' salvation, two things occurred. First of all, his house got clean. He said, Lord, if I've taken anything from anybody unjustly, I'll give fourfold back to that person. And God, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. His house got cleaned up. There was a major difference. Let me say this. If you genuinely had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and he genuinely has done something internally in your life, it's going to be exhibited by what you do outwardly. So his house got clean and then there was a celebration. Jesus said, today salvation has come to you. You are a person of faith. Oh, friend, th th this is a powerful, powerful chapter. See, this day of salvation come to your house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. There was a celebration that happened, celebrated the fact that now I am a man of faith. I have a relationship with Jesus. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. How many of you here at this uh, early service, how many of you here are tired of religion? You're tired of that feeling of being lost. And you're ready this morning for a relationship with Jesus. I, I, I want the real thing. I don't want to just have my name on a church roll. I just don't want to be just baptized. I want the real thing. I want a personal, intimate, close relationship with Jesus. He knows where you are. He knows who you are. And now you need to do all you can to get to him. How do, you, how do I do that? Well, you admit that you're lost. And you admit that you can't do anything about your life. That only he can clean up your house. I wonder how many of you now with every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many of you would say, God, I'm grateful that you know where I am. And here on this first Sunday in March, Lord, I'm up in that tree. And I know that you're passing by because I have a huge desire in my heart for my life to be different than what it is. How many of you sitting here right now would admit, Pastor, I'm lost. I know that if I were to die that I'd spend eternity in hell. I, I am lost without Jesus. I've never had a relationship with him. And I believe that he is drawing me to himself this morning because I don't want my life to be the same as it was. I want my life to be different. I want to know him. I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. Well, what's left is for you to do exactly what Zacchaeus did and that's respond to his call. I'm going to ask you to come down out of that tree Take Jesus home with you. Would you pray something like this with me? Would you just cry out to God right now in your seat? God, I know that I'm a sinner. And my sin has separated me from you. And I've been running a long time. Today, Father, I want to quit running. I want to quit hiding. I want to quit pretending. I want to know you. Please forgive me of all my sin. 
right here in my seat. I receive you into my heart and into my life. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.